Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's How to Work with USAID uh, webinar. My name is Matt Johnson. I'm the Communications Director for USAID's Office of Acquisition Assistance, our Grants and Contracts Office, as well as the agency's industry liaison. Uh, I'm joined by two colleagues, uh, Rachel Chilton uh, and Vivian Nguyen, who you'll hear from today during our presentation. Um, we will be recording today's session, uh, so if you're um, tuning in just a little bit later, want to follow up on things, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel uh, later today. Uh, you can find that we'll be dropping links uh, in the presentation while we're talking. We'll also send a follow-up email uh, with all the links that we cover and highlight during today's webinar and presentation. Um, we want to be able to answer your questions. We want this to be an interactive session uh, towards the end. So. Um, we encourage you to drop questions into the Q&A box while we were, are going through and presenting today. Uh, and so what we want to do is really talk to you about sort of a, how to work with USAID, really a, a 101, some of the basics of things you need to understand about the agency uh, in order to be in a position to partner with us. Uh, so Vivian will talk to a little bit about how to work with about USAID, kind of who we are as an organization. Rachel will dive into ways to partner with the agency. Vivian will also walk you through our work with USAD.org platform, and then I'll talk you through some ways to get connected after today's webinar, uh, as well as uh, have uh, hopefully some time for questions and answers. So, like I said, I encourage you to go through uh, and drop the questions into the chat box uh, while we're while we're talking today. Uh, so, once again, it's really a pleasure uh, uh, to be with you, and thank you for joining. And I'm going to turn it over to Vivian just to talk a little bit about how to work with or about USAID as an organization. So, Vivian, over to you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us. So, first, I'm just going to go over the basics of our organization, like Matt has said. So, USAID, just like any other organization, has a unique history, culture, and the way of doing business. And so, while you're um, you know, hoping to find partnership opportunities with us, this is really important to understand. Uh, so, USAID carries out uh, US foreign policy uh, by improving the lives and well being of people living in poverty. And at the same time, uh, we work to expand democracy and promoting free markets. Although our work is separate from political and military assistance around the world, uh, USAID programs address security and development objectives. And our main goal here is to build a world that is safer, healthier, and more prosperous for everyone. So um, one thing that's important to know is the United States is actually the world's largest donor of foreign assistance. And so we work in a lot of different uh, sectors and um, help people in all sorts of different ways. Uh, so, as you can see from some of our icons here, these are some of the ways that we help people. And so, we you know, work on agricultural productivity around the world uh, so we can ensure families don't go hungry and have secure food resources. Um, we also work in a lot of global health uh, areas such as child mortality, uh, maternal mortality. Um, and then also work to prevent and eradicate certain diseases like HIV, malaria, and um, tuberculosis. Um, we also provide humanitarian assistance, as you may have seen um, throughout Ukraine and Ethiopia in the last few years. Uh, and then we also work to promote uh, democracy, human rights, and governance around the world. These are just some of the programs that we work on, um, but we work on a lot of different things that you could see um, through social media and USAID.gov and blogs like Medium. So it's really important to understand how we do our work. Um, so we work in over 100 countries around the world, um, and we have a team of over 9,000 staff. And so our staff is comprised of three different kind of main categories. Um, the first is foreign service officers. We have about 1,800 foreign service officers who are U.S. citizens that work in U.S. embassies around the world, but we also call them missions. Uh, they typically will work in these assignments for two to four years. And then we also have 1,200 civil service employees um, who are U.S. citizens that typically work in the United States here in Washington, D.C. or around the world. And then lastly, um, kind of the heart of our work is our foreign service nationals who make up about 6,000 
6,000 percent, not percent, <laughs> uh, 6,000 of our employees. Uh, and they work in our missions and they're uh, natives of their respective countries. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A section. Um, so the next thing is uh, some terminology that you'll hear throughout your time of partnering with USAID. Um, so I'll go over our operating framework. So at the heart of our work is the core belief that each country must lead its own development journey. Uh, therefore, we are making progress towards that goal by realigning how we partner so that we can better support our countries um, and implement activities that are relevant to um, their local context. So the first uh, tool that you need to know about is called the prog program cycle. And this looks at everything we do from policies to strategic planning to project design and implementation as well as monitoring evaluation and incorporating uh, those lessons learned back into our programming. Uh, we also in Washington have a series of policy strategies, frameworks and visions of guiding how we work. Uh, so for example, we have a global water strategy and uh, launching soon is our acquisition assistance strategy. So be on the lookout for that one as well. Additionally, uh, each mission at USAID has a country development cooperation strategy, uh, which is also known as the CDCS. Um, this is a generally a five year strategy that outlines the missions and goals of um, our partner countries and what technical areas they intend to work in. Uh, we also have the ADS, the automated directive system, uh, which is the agency's operational policies and procedures. So if you're ever unsure of a policy, um, you can uh, Google or search our website for ADSs and it'll go through um, what you need to know in that area. And then uh, later you'll learn when responding to a proposal or request application. And so you'll definitely need to look up these ADSs um, so you can understand uh, our application process. Next, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Vivian. Um, I do want to just, you know, talk a little bit about before we go kind of dive into the partnership process, just about how we fund our work. Uh, so it's important to know that all of USAID's funding comes from the American people. It's American tax dollars that come into USAID's budget. Um, and our budget, we get a budget each year from our Congress that's sort of negotiated between the president's office, the Congress, as well as USAID. Uh, but Congress sets our funding levels every year. And oftentimes those funding levels have uh, different um, uh, restrictions or um, kind of programs that we have to implement across the world. Um, out of those kind of different funding levels, we get set up each year, um, as Vivian highlighted in the previous slide, we have something called our country, our develop CDCSs, our country development cooperation strategies, uh, or I see a question in the chat box about regional strategies. We also have regional development cooperation strategies that look at larger regions. Uh, but really, out of the funding that we get, we then have our strategies that we then use to implement our programs and our activities around the world. So if you're interested in working with USAID in any country, any region around the world, it's really important to first, one of the first things to do is look at our country development cooperation strategies or regional development cooperation strategies, because uh, those will tell you about the programs and activities that USAID is planning on doing in a particular country. And really what we're looking for in partners, organizations that have alignment with the work that they're doing and the work that USAID is doing. Uh, but out of those strategies, USAID will then develop specific programs or activities uh, and organizations then compete for funding uh, for, for, uh, to implement these different programs and activities. Because we are a, a US government federal agency, there's a competitive process for our, how all of our funding is given out each year. Uh, and so it's important to note that, you know, we would love to just be able to hand out grants to just about anyone, but there is, like I said, there's a competitive process uh, by which it follows, um, as well as, um, you know, we have our different priorities and strategies of what we're trying to implement in our programs and countries around the world. Uh, and so with that, I want to turn it over to our colleague, Rachel, now to talk a little bit about sort of the partnering process with USAID. And that we've talked a little bit about how the agency uh, works and who we are as an organization. So Rachel, over to you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Matt and Vivian. Really appreciate it. I'd just like to turn now to our partnership process and, and walk you through um, how you can navigate this because we know it can be complex and we want to try to make it as simple as possible for everyone. So first, just a little bit about our partners. USAID is very passionate about tapping into the expertise, resources, and innovations of a diverse array of organizations across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to find and implement uh, solutions to the development challenges that we face. And I will drop in the chat here a link um, that you can visit that showcases the different types of partners that you see on the screen and how each of those entities um, may potentially partner with USAID. Uh, so we do partner with many different types of organizations, both US-based as well as non-US based uh, organizations. And today we have, I believe, more than 3,500 partners worldwide, and we're looking to continue to expand uh, that number and diversify it as much as possible. I'd like to talk a little bit about how our funds work. So the majority of USAID's funds are awarded competitively through contracts, grants, or what we call a cooperative agreement. Um, so, for acquisition, this means that USAID utilizes contracts, um, and you can see on the screen that those are found on SAM.gov. Um, so, contracts are used when we need to purchase technical services, goods, um, and, prod and or products from responsible parties. And this is usually from US or locally based firms um, to be able to implement specific programs as directed by the agency. So again, you can find uh, current contract solicitation opportunities on uh, a website called SAM.gov. Um, as for assistance, USAID utilizes what we call grants and or cooperative agreements. Um, and we usually partner with both international and national nonprofit organizations. Um, often referred to as non-governmental organizations or NGOs. Uh, so both of these types of solicitations can be found on a website called grants.gov, and they are usually listed um, as a notice of funding opportunity when you are searching there. Um, so for grants, USAID provides funds to a responsible grantee to implement a program with little direct involvement during the life of the program. Whereas for a cooperative agreement, um, this is these are proposed when USAID provides funds to a partner, but has more substantial involvement and contact with the partner um, during the life of the project. So you can see in the chat, thank you, Vivian, she dropped some links to all of these things for you, including um, some tutorials on how to walk through these websites, because we know they can be a little bit confusing to um, find USAID specific opportunities. So we do have tutorials there that walk you through how to search for them. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about USAID's uh, business forecast. So this is a super important resource for anyone that wants to partner with USAID. Um, given that the agency works in more than 80 countries, it's we know it's challenging for small or new organizations to be able to stay on top of upcoming opportunities. So on our business forecast, this gives you an advanced look at what USAID is, you know, anticipates planning um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so this this forecast allows you to see what uh, we are planning, whether it's at a certain mission country. Um, or Bureau here in Washington, <clears throat> and there are a variety of different opportunities um, on our forecast. We do require that any competitive acquisition or assistance opportunity, any open competitive um, opportunity over 150,000 be included on the forecast um, before a solicitation is posted on SAM.gov or grants.gov. Um, we do still encourage our staff to post opportunities under that threshold on the forecast as well. Um, so that's just something important to note. But when you visit our forecast page, you'll see, like you see on the screen here, um, you know, an, an operating unit, the sector in which the uh, proposed activity falls under, the award length, um, et cetera. And it, the forecast is live, so it's updated on a daily basis. Um, so you have the most up-to-date information when you're searching our forecast, which we are excited that we are able to provide that to you. 
Um, and we do also host what we call quarterly business forecast and partner update webinars. Um, I believe we will have our second quarter forecast call coming up sometime in early March. Um, so you can be on the lookout for that. Uh, we do use that opportunity to allow partners and prospective partners to ask questions about specific opportunities that are listed on the forecast. I believe in the last few quarters, we've answered anywhere from 1500 to 2000 questions. Um, so we get a lot of questions and work hard with our staff to get all the answers back out to you. And we also invite senior leaders from across the agency to that webinar to provide updates about specific priorities, whether it's related to um, localization, our new partnership initiative, uh, US small business, things like that. So uh, we certainly encourage you to take time to join that if you can. And just like today's session, we always re record those as well and post them on our YouTube channel if you are not able to join. So if you haven't checked out our business forecast, would recommend you do so. Um, just wanted to also note a few additional partnership programs that the agency offers. So if you have a specific type of innovation um, idea that you would like to propose, we would encourage you to visit the Development Innovation Venture, also known as DIV. Uh, web, web page. It is a rolling application process. You can visit that to walk through, you know, if you're eligible, your idea is eligible, how to apply, et cetera. Um, we also have what we call a new partnerships initiative, and this is aimed at lowering the barriers for new partners, including local uh, organizations, U.S. small businesses, and so on. So you can learn more about that particular initiative on the website link noted there. Uh, we also have what we call a Global Development Alliance, known as our GDA, um, that provides opportunities for USAID and the private sector to work together. And finally, we also have our American Hospitals, Schools and Hospitals Abroad program, uh, known as OSHA, and this provides assistance to schools, libraries, and hospital centers overseas. So just a few different uh, types of programs that you may not necessarily see uh, posted elsewhere, so wanted to flag those for you. <clears throat> and finally, before we get to our uh, demo of our new new ish website, um, I just also wanted to note the importance of making sure your entity is registered. So we've talked about what USAID does and how USAID awards its funds, but to to be eligible to receive funds um, from the US government, your entity will need to be registered in the, the SAM website, which is called the System for Award Management. Um, the latest process is called a Unique Entity Identifier, also known as a UEI. Um, and if you're a US-based company, you will receive a CAGE code. Um, and if you're non-US-based, you will receive an NCAGE code. Uh, Vivian just dropped in a super helpful link um, for a blog that helps you walk through this process because we know it can take some time. Um, we do recommend that you prepare a checklist of all of the different items you need to be able to enter uh, your information into these systems. That includes things like your business address, the name of your CEO, information about the goods and services that you provide, and other details. Um, unfortunately, it's important to also know that you need to you can only register in English um, so we do know that can be a barrier for some but the system is set up that way currently um, and it can take several hours to complete so we just wanted to highlight this for you because um, you do need to be registered in order to be eligible to receive fund funding from the US government from any US government agency um, so we certainly encourage you to look at that blog, and if you have any questions, you're always more than welcome to to email us. Um, so that's just a little bit about the partnership process, how to find funding opportunities and things like that. Um, so I will hand it back to Vivian to walk through our newest website. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. All right, while well, Matt switches his screen. Uh, so this is workwithusa.org. Um, we proudly launched this last year, November 2020.
21, yeah, <laughs> or two years ago, I guess. Um, so this website is intended for anyone who is interested in work with USAID and may not um, necessarily know where to start. Um, I know we've given some 101 information today about uh, working with USAID, but we've created this platform so people can come learn um, with more interactive tools and learn at their own pace. So here's our homepage. Uh, as you scroll down, you can see some of our um, tools and resources that I'll go over a little bit more. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the checklist. So we've actually surveyed our partners and we've learned that most people, again, do not know where to start. So we created this checklist so for you to get the first um, kind of glimpse of the things you need to know. So if you go ahead and expand on some of these questions, you can see some really basic answers that you may need to know. A really important thing we wanted to note is that we have translated this document in a variety of languages. So you can see here, we have Arabic, Burmese, Spanish, Swahili, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, and a few others. And we're always trying to add more um, so more people can access this. So you can go ahead and download that as well um, and save it to your computer for easier access at another point. Uh, and then next, let's go to the um, partner directory. So we know at USAID that there are so many organizations out in the world that we might know about. And so we created this partner directory so um, you as an organization can be visible to us, but also um, your colleagues in the international development space. So here uh, you can find other partners. So let's just go ahead and sample one. So let's put in sectors. Yeah, I'll let you pick Matt. And while he's doing that, so the partner directory, I think we have almost over 3,000 uh, partners already listed uh, on our partner directory. And this is free to use. Um, we want to use have this as a tool for you to be able to connect with the agency and other partners. Um, so let's go ahead and click on one. Major Alliance Education. Uh, center. So here you can see their profile. So they, you have an opportunity to upload a logo or a photo. You can identify what kind of organization you are. So this one, they say they're an NGO, but they are also an ec ec economically disadvantaged joint venture and a women owned business. And they also work in a variety of sectors and are based in, let's see, Tanzania. Uh, and then you get an opportunity to write a, a little blurb about your organization. And so when you create a profile, you uh, will fill out all of this information and it will go through a quality control process. So you'll receive a confirmation that uh, your submission was received and then we'll go and approve it. Um, sorry, and then the last thing is you also have an opportunity to create a social media link. So if you have social media like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera, you can also link there so people can learn more about your organization and get connected to you. So that's what they look like. And again, if anybody has any questions about this, um, we can answer them later. And then I'll also reference the FAQ as well. Okay, so next let's go to the pre-engagement assessment. So the pre-engagement assessment is a uh, tool to help you gauge if you are ready to work with USAID. So we have compiled 48 questions here under five different categories, namely programming, compliance, human resources, program management, and budget and finance. So as you go through this uh, pre-engagement assessment, you'll kind of get a sense of your readiness to work with USAID um, throughout this whole process. And if you don't answer this, can't answer a question right now, you can go ahead and save and then continue at a later time. And um, there's no right or wrong answers. We really encourage you to um, use this as a tool to learn um, because this doesn't go back to USAID. It doesn't um, 
affect your ability to work with you, uh, partner with the agency or compete for funding. This is merely an informational tool for you to assess your readiness. And then at the end of the assessment, um, you'll get a customized report um, where you'll get a summary of your results. So here you can see that the sample is moderate, advanced, and then you'll also get um, your key findings and then also resources and next steps. So you can reference this at any point, and then we highly encourage you to share it with others in your organization as well. And then so you can develop an action plan to uh, improve your capacity. And then next we can go to the library. So after you finish your uh, pre-engagement assessment, we highly recommend that you go to the library to get some more in-depth resources or even short res small resources for you to get information on where you can improve your capacity. So we have documents, uh, videos, webinars, courses, training modules, et cetera, um, on a variety of different topics, such as diversity, equity, inclusion, compliance, financial management, um, monitoring and evaluation, et cetera. So you can click through multiple of these to find what you're looking for. And we highly encourage you as well, if you your organization has a resource that you wanna be added to the library, uh, we have a link at the bottom of the page where you can nominate a resource. And we're always looking for more suggestions on what to add, uh, so feel free. And then next, we can go to the events and insights. So events, hopefully some of you found this event through our events page. Um, this is constantly being updated with uh, events happening in the agency, but also our partners. So you can go ahead and select a date or categories. And then we also have a button there on the right where if your organization is hosting an event, you can go ahead and also submit an event to be on our webpage. And then next we can go to a blog. So our blog is the ever-changing content on our website. Um, so here you can find partnership stories, listicles of tips, um, interviews from USAID employees. So here, like for example, here's a guest blog from Environmental Incentives, Demystifying Environmental Compliance. So here you can learn some information about environmental compliance. And we also encourage you that if you uh, are interested in writing a guest blog, we also have um, a mechanism for you to do that as well. So if you have a local like, success story, uh, we'd love to hear about it and work with you to promote your story as well. And then we have a funding tab. So Rachel has previously talked about the business forecast, sam.gov and grants.gov. So if you're ever looking for those pages or you forget uh, which ones we were talking about, you can find them on this tab here. And then lastly, we have a frequently asked questions section. So here, um, I'm sure you've heard a lot of acronyms today and anytime you're um, reading about USAID. So here, if you ever have a question about USAID, we've gathered a lot of different uh, questions about partnering with USAID. And you like just like the checklist, you can expand and open um, some of these topics and read more, or you can use the search bar. Um, so for example, let's say you keep seeing the word request for information. What is a request for information? And you'll scroll down. Oh, <laughs> maybe it's request. Oh, we, there you go. So you can learn what an RFI is like that. And then um, I guess before I said lastly, that was incorrect. Um, we do have a chat box. 
So if you go to the corner, um, we call this Ask Zara. So if you need any assistance in navigating the website, um, you can go to the chat box. How do I join the partner directory? Here you go. There you go. So definitely, if you have questions of Zara, feel free to reach out to Zara. If you have a question that Zara cannot answer, uh, we have our email at the bottom, um, and Rachel can definitely link it in the chat. It's industryliaison at usa.gov. Uh, and then I think that's it. Uh, Matt, I will turn it back to you. Thanks, Vivian. Um, and just before we get into Q and A, I do want to talk about a couple of resources, ways to stay connected. We'll be dropping these links into the chat box. Uh, we do really want to hear from you after today's webinar, uh, and also during today's webinar. I'm going to open up a poll real quick, just while we're while we're chatting, going into the Q and A box. We'd love to hear about your experience working with USAID, whether or not you have worked with USAID, what type of organization you are, as well as where you're located. Um, but just to, to stay connected, so we have a, a work with USAID newsletter we send out once a month uh, that provides updates, tips, and resources, uh, as well as events around how to work with USAID. Uh, you can sign up for our, our newsletter, which will drop a, a link into the chat box in a second. Uh, we're also very active on social media. It's one of the best ways I would stay, uh, stay to stay engaged with us, uh, in particular our LinkedIn group, our work with USAID LinkedIn group. Uh, we post uh, daily funding opportunities. We go through everything that's happening on SAM.gov and Grants.gov, and we share those announcements, a curated list of those announcements on our LinkedIn group, uh, as well as posting other resources. Other uh, international organizations post resources on work with you, on our work with USAID LinkedIn group. Uh, so if you're on LinkedIn, it's a great way to stay connected to us, uh, a great way to get information, stay up to date of what's happening within the agency. Um, obviously, we encourage you to visit workwithusaid.org. I think one of the most important things you could do is today is go on and add your information into our partner directory. The partner directory is really a key resource that allows us to connect to you, but also other organizations to connect to you and for you to connect to them. Uh, one thing we, we didn't mention is the, the partner directory. Once you're signed up in the partner directory, we have a, uh, a mailing feature where you can actually connect and engage and email and contact other organizations that are in the partner directory. Uh, so it's a great way to get uh, engaged USAID for all of our funding opportunities uh, for all of our programs. We do market research. We try and identify who are some of the capable local organizations, small businesses, larger organizations that are doing work. We use our partner directory to kind of help identify and do some of that market research. So really encourage you to take a look uh, at the directory there. Uh, and then um, just two other resources. Uh, obviously, uh, we shared our, our email address, industry liaison at USAID.gov. Uh, that goes directly to mine, Vivian's, and Rachel's email box, so you can feel free to reach out to us anytime there. Uh, and then we also have a blog on workwithusaid.org, just around seven ways to introduce yourself to, to USAID. Uh, and so if you're interested in um, you know, getting connected, uh, letting USAID know who you are, just even outside of this webinar, um, encourage you to take a look at that blog there. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to our Q&A now. I see we've had a lot of questions that have come in through the chat box, which I really appreciate. Um, all the questions that have come in. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick. Um, and then go over to the Q&A bar that we've got. I don't know, Rachel or Vivian, if you want to maybe pull up with the first couple of questions that we've got. We can get started. Sure. I think I got a private one first, if I can ask that, or maybe it just came to us as panelists. Um, so someone was asking if registration on the partner directory is a prerequisite to be able to receive funds from the agency. I can take that. No, uh, participation in workwithusa.org is totally voluntary. Um, it's supposed to be a tool to help you connect um, with other development partners. 
Uh, so you do not need a partner directory profile uh, to compete for funding with USAID, but we highly encourage it. Thanks, Thanks Vivi. I say, I, you know, I, I also got a couple other questions that um, I can help answer or address. So one of the questions that came in was, are grant opportunities open to both for-profit and non-profit organizations? Uh, so the answer is yes to that. So um, we often talk about things versus grants, contracts, and cooperative agreements or for-profit or not-for-profit organizations. There is nothing that prohibits a, a non-profit organization going for a contract, which, you know, you would able to see profit for the work. Uh, if you're a, a for-profit organization, there's no reason why you couldn't go for uh, a grant or a cooperative agreement, uh, something where you don't receive profit for your work. Uh, oftentimes, it comes down to maybe internal systems of how you track funding, uh, but it's really a business decision that you as an organization um, would want to make. But you can look at both funding opportunities on SAM.gov and grants.gov, no matter who you are as an organization. And Rachel, do you want to pull up some other questions as well? Yes, trying to get back to the questions. Um, let's see. I think I've answered a few of them. Uh, someone asked if the div, the development innovation venture program um, is open for all development partners for wider programs, or if it's just for like entrepreneurs and startup companies. Yeah, that's a great question. So the div program is open to any organization. Really, what the the purpose of the div program is to try and identify innovative solutions, and those innovative solutions can come from anyone. You know, development organizations, non development organizations, entrepreneurs, others, uh, and so it's really set up um, as a great kind of entry point for any organization that has a really innovative idea that can be applied to development. Thanks, Matt, and thanks, Vivian, for sharing the div link in the chat. Um, let's see, someone asked if subcontractors also need to be registered in the, the SAM uh, system for award management platform. Um, I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, it's important to be registered in that system. Um, oftentimes, if you're a, a subcontractor, there are reporting requirements that the sort of prime contractor, the organization that's getting funding from USAID, um, has to have. And so uh, being registered in that system allows them to more easily report up that information. So it is an important thing to be registered in. Thank you. I do see someone noted that the registration process can take quite a bit of time in SAM, and we, we understand that um, the website is owned by a different U.S. government agency. So we've been trying our best to help uh, USAID specific and potential USAID partners um, you know, navigate the process. We do know that the unique entity ID um, came into effect. Well, I guess it's been since last year now. I keep forgetting it's 2023, um, last April. So we know that there have been challenges and um, we do really hope that the process starts to smooth out for people. Um, Matt, I'm not sure if you had anything else to add to that. Yeah, you know, I think if you are, um, I think for the same registration process, when they rolled out the new unique entity ID, there was a long backlog. My understanding is um, that backlog is now gone. There is no longer a backlog. It still does take time and energy to, to get registered in the system. And uh, I know we dropped a link earlier in the chat box, uh, but we do have a step-by-step -step guide of how to get registered in it. One of the, the documents I personally find most helpful is a, a PDF that basically says, here's all the documents you need when you go to register in these systems. So even before you sit down to begin your registration process, you have a little checklist of all the information that you need available to do that. Uh, and then the other thing I'll just say is, you know, if you are working with USAID or you're about to get a contract or a grant or cooperative agreement from USAID and you're not registered in SAM, we do have some flexibilities. Um, as long as you've made a good faith effort to uh, get registered in the systems, we can, uh, in some cases, begin working with your organization. So, um, but I would just encourage you to, if you are interested in getting um, U.S. government funding, not just USAID funding, but any U.S. government funding, to get registered in those systems. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask a question about geographic codes? I know this is a question that comes up a lot. So someone asked if an organization whose headquarters falls outside of the geographic code, but um, has registration in the country of the activity, can they still be eligible for the funding? 
Yeah, so for those of you that aren't familiar, so USAID um, uses something called the Principal Geographic Code that determines who's eligible to apply. There's two main codes that we use, code 937, that basically uh, says US-based organizations and organizations that are uh, based in developing countries are uh, eligible to apply for it. And then code 935 basically says anyone kind of anywhere in the world uh, is eligible to apply for it with some restrictions to that. Um, and so if you're a, let's say you're a European organization, um, generally speaking, there's uh, opportunities that would be identified as code 937, you may or may not be eligible to apply for. Uh, USAID does have uh, a way of put, issuing a waiver for um, that. And so, um, you know, if you're a European organization that's doing really great work, um, you know, one of the things I would do is I would encourage you to connect with the team that's working on a specific program or activity, introduce yourself, let them know who you are. Uh, and then there's possibilities of sort of opening up that opportunity to anyone in the world. But specifically the question about a local organization um, uh, applying versus, uh, you know, a larger organization. I think oftentimes it'll come down to um, how your organization is registered in SAM, uh, as well as your cage or in cage code. And so if your local organization has its own unique entity ID, uh, you know, some of its own accounting systems, uh, um, then I think that there are opportunities for where you would be eligible to apply for it. But um, oftentimes, I would just say it comes down to a determination by our staff and team in the field whether or not you're eligible. So, would encourage you to connect with a USAID staff member in country to talk about it in more more detail. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. We do also have two blogs on the geographic code topic, one for acquisition and one for assistance that I dropped in the chat. So, hopefully, people will find those helpful. Um, let's see. Oh my gosh, we have so many I have a questions question that I like. Um, cause we haven't had too much opportunity to talk about sub partnerships. Um, Munir says, hello, I am new to USAID programs. I focus on global health. Would you recommend working with primes as a subcontractor to gain experience? I think that you know, it's a great way to gain experience working as a sub partner. Um, and so, you know, within the sort of USAID funding, uh, Rachel mentioned, you know, we have about 3,500 organizations that get funding from USAID. But what often happens is those organizations get funding and they need to bring in other organizations, expertise and other fields. And so they do a lot of subcontracting out where you're, you know, the flow of money, the money is coming from USAID, but you have sort of a legal relationship with uh, a different organization, what we call a prime partner. Um, but it really is a great way to get your foot in the door to, I think, working in kind of the international development space, working with USAID funding. You know, one of the advantages of working with a, a prime contractor, working as a subcontractor, is um, you really get to to learn about um, what does it mean to manage U.S. government funding. Um, oftentimes, they have tools and capabilities and resources in house that help you build your own capacity and get you in a better position to be able to to compete for USAID funding. Uh, and then the one other thing on the, on the contract side in particular, when we're issuing contracts, one of the things that USAID often looks at is past performance. You know, has an organization done work similar to this uh, in the past? Uh, and so being a sub partner or subcontractor is a great way to get some of that past performance experience. Thanks, Matt. Um, I see a good question here that I know folks ask a lot. Uh, so, if you've never received USAID funding for a project, does that make you less competitive than others who have? If it's your first time applying, is there a smaller scope of funding um, that you're more competitive for? Or does it just like depend on your project concept and its viability? Like what makes it, you know, they just want to know if, if you haven't received it in the past, uh, what does that mean for you? Yeah, that is a, that's a great question. Um, so USAID has all different types of contracts within contracts, grants and cooperative agreements. There's all different types of variations of it. Um, but if you're a new partner, 1 of the things I would specifically encourage you to look at are, um, opportunities where USAID is just calling for a concept note. Um, if you go to our, our LinkedIn page, there's, a, I think it's people for people or people to people program that was just announced on grants.gov where we are just seeking concept notes for organizations. Oftentimes, those concept notes are just a three to five page document outlining what is your idea uh, and how does it you know, help meet the goals that the agency has outlined in a particular opportunity. 
those are great opportunities for newer organizations to apply for funding to USAID. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see, and th those I would just note for the oftentimes those types of funding opportunities, they're smaller amounts. Um, you know, anywhere between um, you know one million to maybe five million dollars, which is still a lot of money. Uh, but oftentimes you'll see other funding opportunities that are you know anywhere between a hundred million dollars uh, and, and higher. And those larger contracts oftentimes have additional requirements, restrictions about, um, or not just additional requirements about what information you need to provide to apply for funding. So I would specifically look at opportunities that um, are calling for concept notes. Uh, oftentimes you'll see them, some of the other terminology, things you can take a look at afterwards are when is USAID issues an annual program statement. An annual program statement sort of a call is oftentimes a call for concept notes in a particular area. The div program is an example of that. Um, the people for people program is an example of uh, calling for concept notes. So um, anyways, I would just say I would specifically look at opportunities where USAID is asking for concept notes um, and that would be a great place to get started. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate that. I also dropped a link in our chat again to our LinkedIn group. Um, we do try to post links to specific USAID opportunities every day in there from SAM.gov and Grants.gov. So if you haven't joined the group yet, we would highly encourage you to do so. Uh, Vivian, I don't know if you see any other, I feel like we've answered quite a few questions. Um, I do see one. So someone asked if there are any major conferences um, that you hold in the US, if you think there are particularly good opportunities for networking as a new entrant, you know, are there any other opportunities um, where people can network with folks in the development community and or USAID? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, USAID does a lot of conferences around the world. You'll see uh, a lot of uh, industry days and events taking place both in country in Washington, D.C., uh, one of our big conferences every year is an annual small business conference where we invite small businesses in. Uh, that's a great way to get engaged. We've done a couple of overseas small business conferences in South Africa and then one in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Um, I would also um, note there's a number of large kind of associations, partner associations, organizations that also help bring together um, development organizations. Um, you know, if you're overseas, there's a, a group called the Movement for Community-Led Development. Uh, there's another group. Uh, there's groups called Humenta, um, the Professional Services Council, the Small Business Association of International Development Companies, uh, Sid Washington, as well as Interaction. Uh, these are all groups that are kind of set up to bring together international development organizations and individuals to get together and connect. So um, if you're having specific questions about that, you can reach out to us and we can share links to some of these websites of other uh, associations and organizations that are a great way to get connected to the international development space. So someone asked, um, because USAID wants to work with more diverse partners, will there be upcoming grants that are smaller in amount to allow more local smaller organizations uh, to apply since they most likely have not had any history with managing grants, you know, up to $5 million. Yes, I think the answer to that is definitely there'll be more smaller grants uh, available. I think this past year, I think we doubled the amount of smaller grants that USAID is an organization, almost doubled the amount of smaller grants that USAID issued. Uh, and so um, you definitely see more and more of those opportunities. Like I said, oftentimes you'll see those coming out as a co for concept notes. One of the, the great things about responding to a concept note is oftentimes there isn't sort of like a set fixed amount of like, hey, you know, we're going to give you $5 million. It's tailored specifically to your concept note, the work that you're doing. Uh, and so I would encourage you to take a look at those in particular. Uh, and then once you even get sort of a, you know, get your concept note in, um, we bring you in and we do something what's called co-creation where we work with you to fully develop your concept notes. Um, and um, if it's something that we're interested in pursuing, work with you to do that and then kind of help your organization walk through getting registered in different systems and make sure that you're able to apply for, uh, make sure your organization is able to adequately manage the funding. 
We have a question about uh, contracts. Uh, Asif asks, what is a category management contract vehicle? Yeah, so that's uh, getting a little bit more technical, um, but so category management is this government wide initiative where um, we believe if we're purchasing common goods and services, like if we're purchasing computers, you know, rather than going every federal agency, every office going off and purchasing things on their own, how can we buy things in bulk? How do we have negotiated rates around things? Uh, and so category management is a government wide initiative where we're trying to basically consolidate common spending. Uh, common spending items. Uh, and so there's different what we call vehicles or contracts that are already set up um, by other government agencies. A lot of times it's the general services administration has set up um, what's called GSA schedules or other contracts that have pre-negotiated rates, uh, already identified vendors. Uh, and so for USAID, it's a way to more quickly purchase goods and services um, that are oftentimes um, have already been negotiated. So um, if you, I think, look, search, just do some searching for category management, you can find some of that information. Um, the one of the, the major category management vehicles that we use at USAD is a, 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 a GSA schedule called OASIS. Uh, so if you just search for OASIS, you can find information about that there. That's one of the, the more common um, tools that we as an organization use. Okay. Um, I know there's probably a lot more um, questions that folks have, and I, I know we're coming up on time here, um, but I do just want to say thank you again for everyone joining our webinar today. Thank you, Vivian and Rachel, for sharing. Thanks to everyone that asked questions. Uh, we would love to hear from you afterwards, so feel free to follow us, follow up with us at industry liaison at USAD.gov. Um, we'd love to get connected to you as well on our different social media channels. Uh, just as a way of staying connected and engaged. And, um, we'll send a follow-up email hopefully later today or, or early tomorrow morning with all the different links that we provide as well as a link to this webinar for you to, to take a look at again. So thanks again, everyone, and we look forward to staying connected with you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye.